Clinton appears to be making a fashion statement by adopting the left's trendiest new accessory, a tinfoil hat. While taking questions at a tech conference in California today, Clinton dismissed the scandal over her private email server as a non-issue of zero importance. My email account was uh, turned into, you know, the biggest scandal since Lord knows when. This was the biggest nothing burger ever. It was a mistake. I've said it was a mistake. And obviously, if I got turned the clock back, I wouldn't have done it in the first place. But the way that it was used uh, was very damaging. It meant nothing. It was totally irrelevant, which does raise the question, if it didn't mean anything, why did it hurt her campaign so much? She had an explanation for that, too. She said because the right-wingers in the media, the Washington Post and the New York Times, wouldn't let it go. I know you had Dean Bacay here from the New York Times uh, yesterday, and they covered it like it was Pearl Harbor. And then in their endorsement of me, they said, this email thing, it's like a help desk issue. So it was always a hard issue to put to bed, but we put it to bed in July and then it rose up again. Okay, so the New York Times is biased against Democrats. A novel defense, you say? Oh, but it got weirder from there, a lot weirder. Hillary went on to deliver a narrative so complex we could barely, very, barely follow it, but we did. She explained how Donald Trump and Russia teamed up to rob her of her rightful job as president of the United States. How did they know what messages to deliver? Who told them? Who told them? Yeah. Who were they coordinating with or colluding with? There's all these stories about, you know, guys over in Macedonia who are running these fake news sites. The Russians, in my opinion, and based on the intel and counter intel people I've talked to, could not have known how best to weaponize that information unless they had been guided. And here's a... Here's guided a, by Americans. Guided by Americans. Within one hour, one hour of the Access Hollywood tapes being leaked, within one hour, the Russians, let's say WikiLeaks, same thing, dumped <laughs> the John Podesta emails. Oh, the Russians, but not just the Russians, the guys in Macedonia. So here's what Hillary Clinton is asking you to believe. Her campaign had no message or economic agenda or really any idea what voters wanted in the last election. But that didn't matter, none of it. They were going to win anyway. It was guaranteed by God himself. Then, at the last minute, the Trump campaign, which had half the money Hillary had, almost no staff or institutional support from anybody, came up with the diabolical idea to reach out directly to the government of Vladimir Putin and his army of bloggers and hackers and request emergency help. Putin complied, of course, because Trump was his puppet, perhaps even a secret agent of the Kremlin working directly for him. What happened next is history, or as Hillary herself might put it, her story. Unnamed members of Trump's campaign asked Russia to hack the DNC and the personal Gmail account of Clinton's campaign chairman, John Podesta, having deduced this must be the best way to hurt her in the campaign. The emails they exposed found a cushy relationship between the media and the Democratic Party. They showed evidence the Democratic primary process was rigged in Clinton's favor. They exposed Wall Street speech transcripts Clinton wanted to keep secret. The Trump people imagined all of this would be enough to win, but not so. In fact, Hillary explains today the emails the Russian hacked were boring and contained nothing of note, nothing worth knowing. So to increase the potency of this scheme, the Trump campaign ordered Russia to manufacture something called fake news out of the emails and distribute them through their network of bogus news outlets, which, by the way, they have. You probably didn't know that. Now researchers at Stanford have actually discovered that the fake news Hillary refers to was seen by almost nobody and believed by even fewer people. But according to Hillary, it was enough in the end to bamboozle the sad and easily confused voters of Pennsylvania and Wisconsin into mistakenly voter for voting for Donald Trump. And by the way, she feels sorry for them for doing that. According to Hillary, the Trump campaign was so intimately tied to the vast Russian propaganda apparatus that they dictated the release of John Podesta's emails down to the minute in order to achieve maximum effect. They were apparently successful in this, even though, according to Hillary, nothing bad was in the emails in the first place, and they should have had no effect at all. Is that diabolical enough for you? Now, keep in mind that Hillary confidently asserted all of this today while providing precisely no evidence that any of it ever happened. A conspiracy so vast, she doesn't need to prove it. Now, no matter how much you may dislike Hillary Clinton, and some of you may, it was a poignant performance to watch. You almost wanted to help her.
Mark Stein is a writer, a columnist, and a regular sub for Rush Limbaugh on the radio, and he joins us tonight. Did, how did you, I mean, did you have the same reaction I did, which is, boy, this is, I mean, this is making me uncomfortable. I feel sorry for this person. Uh, well, that, that was my first reaction. My second reaction, Tucker, was to say, if I ever run for president, I want these same Macedonian campaign consultants <laughs> who are the geniuses. Uh, that's, who, that's who the Russians go to when they want to really sew up a presidential campaign. <laughs> That's too good. Have you noticed you Now we're making fun of Hillary Clinton? And actually, my sympathy for her is sincere because I thought this was deranged, what she said today. But yeah. she's not the first. She's the third Democratic presidential candidate in a row to lose and still make the case I didn't actually lose. Kerry made that case. Gore made that case. Do you see a theme here? Well, in fairness, Al Gore and John Kerry uh, lost to... Uh, conventional candidates. What Donald Trump did was uh, unprecedented. He'd, he'd never been elected to the school board. Uh, he had uh, no ground game. He spent less money than anybody since Chester Arthur. He uh, veered erratically off message, so sometimes he'd be talking about make America great again, and uh, ten minutes later he'd be going on about how Macy's stock has tanked since they stopped <laughs> carrying Trump ties. And yet somehow he manages to beat the most qualified candidate ever to run for the presidency of the, uh, of the United States. And the Democrats and the candidate herself just can't accept that this happened. And in a sense, they're right. If it was a military campaign, they'd be teaching it at staff colleges across the world for the next two centuries. Well, it's I think remarkable. that's a fair point. No, it's, you're making a great point. I mean, this is a pretty conventional defense mechanism, psychological reaction to it. I wish it weren't dragging our foreign policy down along with it, though. No, and I think that's, that's true. I mean, if, if you were Putin, at this stage, let's say that Trump is a Russian agent. Uh, if you were Putin, you'd have to think you'd actually got a twofer. Because right now, Hillary is telling the American people, whatever happens, the uh, Russians are behind it. That's how cunning they are. That's how their, their power is so all-pervasive. Later in that, in that uh, bizarre performance, she starts going on about how Cambridge Analytica, uh, this data mining group, uh, apparently insisted in return for providing Trump with data that he hire Kellyanne Conway and uh, Steve Bannon. So as Hillary sees it, he, Kellyanne Conway is some kind of Soviet honey trap who's at the heart of this, uh, if, uh, of, of this campaign. I don't even understand that because uh, Cambridge Analytica, as I understand it, uh, was set up by some British company. So the plot thickens because now we've got double rogue double agents from MI6, probably uh, Kim Philby, if you remember. <laughs> Cold, yes, cold water. I mean, <laughs> but, the, but that's the thing. And, and you, what you have to ask is who's behind the Russians? Well, it's this Cambridge Analytica. So it's the British behind the Russians. But who's behind the British? Well, it's the Macedonians. They're behind everything. <laughs> but what, I guess what's so ludicrous about this is they're blaming the Trump campaign's collusion with Russia. Now, the Russians, whatever their skills, can't build a reliable escalator. I don't no. think they could pull this off. And the Trump campaign was pure message. Yeah, That's yeah. all they had. They had no money. They were disorganized deeply right. in a lot of ways. Right. There's no way. They could have. I mean, if you know anything about how it actually happened, this is insane. Well, the the, the, the fantastic thing about the Trump campaign, uh, if you forgive me, coming the unassimilated foreigner on you, uh, Tucker, but <laughs> presidential <laughs> politics, the conventions had gotten so hopelessly boring, and Hillary ran an utterly conventional campaign. She paid yeah. talentless, mediocre people large sums of money to do the same things they've done for every other candidate, and Trump just comes along. He's bored, stiff by all that and it says he just does it his way and blows all those stupid conventions out of the water and the republicans hated him for doing that and the democrats still can't actually believe he did it mark stein you are single-handedly making me pro-immigration at least in your case thank you for joining <laughs> More us tonight. macedonian immigrants Tucker. that's what we need <laughs> they're already here <laughs> oh! thanks mark <laughs> yes. joe concha does watch cnn for a living he writes about media for the hill and he joins us right now. So Joe, this was a big story, but not over there. 
It wasn't covered as much, nearly, of course not. And this was embarrassing for CNN. Granted, she's only on there once a year, but still, that is an employee that they were paying uh, to do the New Year's Eve special with Anderson Cooper. But give Kathy Griffin, I'm going to give her some credit here, Tucker, because she is the first person in years to bring the left and the right together in denouncing one issue. When you could have Keith Oberman, Chelsea Clinton, Mitt Romney, and Donald Trump all saying that photo's bad, you know, we're really on to something here. Well, that's right. But, but CNN wasn't part of that. They were sort of standing alone here, and that's because it wasn't news or no one was talking about it, or were there other reasons why they didn't want to get well, into no, it? No, no, no. Look, it, it was the top trending story all day yesterday. Oh. I thought that they would come out after you saw this photo and immediately say she's not part of our New Year's Eve coverage anymore. And it, it took them about a full day, but they eventually did get to taking her off that coverage. And look, we're at a point now where Kathy Griffin has an endorsement with Squatty Potty, a great American company. I have three of them, Tucker. Very catchy slogan, stools for better stools. And they, yesterday, about five minutes after that photo came out, said, we are denouncing Kathy Griffin. We're ending our relationship. It took CNN about another day before they were able to do the same. So that's where we're at now, where Squatty so, Potty is being more decisive than a cable news network that's been in existence for 40 years. <laughs> right. So, like, the toilet company has higher standards than the news channel. Is that what you're saying? But, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth now. No, no. Let's move on. <laughs> so, so what exactly does this mean? And as a factual matter, was she employed by the channel? Was she, uh, you know, coming in every year? Was, were they paying her for that? And how long had she been doing the New Year's thing? Oh, I would think she was absolutely compensated. She's been doing the New Year's Eve thing since 2007 with anchor Anderson Cooper from Times Square. It's a very highly rated special that they do every year, mainly because they got two things out of it. They got ratings because she did a provocative thing, probably, or said a provocative thing. And they got virality because the clips kept moving on and on. So that's probably what delayed CNN's decision here. But look, social media is the great equalizer now in 2017. Tucker. CNN, I think, thought at first probably maybe this will blow over by December when they announce she's coming back. But if that happened, you would have boycotts, which I know you don't like, of advertisers. Yeah. You would have a PR nightmare and you would have people screaming about this because that is an image. Take Trump and Griffin out of it. That is an image of an American citizen holding up a beheaded head of a sitting president, mimicking our greatest enemy, you could argue, in ISIS. And that's something that's etched in people's memories that they would not forget. This is her legacy now, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, she was horrible before, just pandering to the elites and their, their stupid, closed-minded attitudes. So I turned in uh, into that channel yesterday mm -hmm. to see, you know, are they covering this? And what are they covering? Because it's kind of interesting to see their alternative uh, reality. And this is what I saw. Watch. Being president is not agreeing with the president. He complained that his first trip overseas was going to be too long, that he wasn't looking forward to it, and he returned to the White House angry. He's gained weight, uh, according to these sources. He doesn't trust uh, people around him. He's withdrawing. Not a good picture. It's the one being painted by those sources. <laughs> I actually like the anchor over there who just said that, but that line, I really had to put it in my refrigerator. He's gained weight, according to sources. According to sources. You know what the number one complaint of the New York Times readers are? This is according to Republic editors year after year. The overuse of unnamed sources. If I'm a reader just sitting at home, I'm wondering, okay, who has the motivation and the agenda to go on the record with CNN, who Trump, he hasn't appeared on that network since August of 2016. What friend of Trump is running to CNN to talk about how much of a bad mood he's in and how, how, uh, how much weight he's gained? And what is the credibility of this source in the first place. Motive, agenda, credibility. And here's the problem, Tucker. After that story comes out, then everybody else in media picks up the story as gospel because they believe the source who we don't know who it is and what their agenda is. And that's the whole problem with all these bombshells that we've seen for the first 120 days of this presidency. Well, unless it's his personal physician, I, I think you'd have to say nobody knows what he weighs. I mean, like, 